So let's get started then. First of all, welcome, big welcome to our friend, our colleague, uh, Professor Janos, is it Fazikas? Did I say it right? Uh, actually, it's Fazekas, but I think Fazikas. it's uh, almost all right. well, uh, non-Hungarian natives, so uh, as you like it. All right, Fazekas, I can say it properly, okay. uh, who is joining us by Zoom from, uh, I assume you're in Budapest? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we so much wish that we could have you here in Bloomington. And uh, you have a standing invitation now to come back anytime. Um, and uh, we will show you our Indiana hospitality. Um, but we are so sorry you couldn't be here um, in person, um, but very grateful that you are willing to do it via Zoom. Um, we have some students who are sitting here with me in the law school classroom. Um, and we also have many students who have joined uh, directly by Zoom from wherever they may be. Um, what we're gonna do uh, is uh, Professor Fazekas is going to give us a kind of introduction to um, the issue of uh, police stops and searches and how these are regulated in Europe. Um, I think most of the students who are here, uh, Professor, um, are, are somewhat familiar with how this is done in the United States. These are mostly my Bradley fellows who are students with a strong interest in criminal law and criminal procedure. Um, so they may have a background about how it's done in America, but probably know nothing, as I know almost nothing, about how different it might be in Europe. So. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Professor, to um, introduce the topic and tell us what you think we should know. And then whenever you are ready, um, we will pivot to a kind of discussion, a kind of question and answer. And um, because of the dynamics of the room, um, I think once we do that, um, any questions that come either from my students here or from the students who are joining via Zoom, I will repeat the questions just so that everyone can hear them because I'm the one close to the microphone. Okay? All right. Great. All right. Take it away and thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome. I'm very happy to be uh, uh, with you, Professor Hoffman, and uh, with everybody, uh, not in person, unfortunately, but, uh, but online. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to travel to the US because of my uh, positive COVID test uh, last Friday. Uh, however, I have no symptoms at, symptoms at all. So it's a, it's a very uh, tricky kind of uh, COVID-19, uh, but that's how it goes, it seems. Uh, uh, so uh, anyhow, I'm very happy to be uh, with you and uh, I try to share my, uh, my screen. Uh, I hope it uh, works. Yes. Yeah, I think it works. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it works. Okay. Okay, nice. Uh, so, um, police uh, stops and searches um, in, uh, in Europe. Um, it, is, uh, it is one of my, my main research areas, police stops and searches in Europe and especially uh, in Hungary. Uh, but not uh, really as uh, as a as a professor or researcher of Alta University, uh, Budapest, Hungary, uh, but as a member of uh, a European Union research program or research network. This is the EU Cost Action on Police Stops. Uh, uh, Cost is a European Union funded uh, uh, research program. Um, um, every European Union member state. Uh, uh, can delegate researchers uh, and university lecturers to uh, cost actions. And uh, some years ago, uh, um, a new cost action was funded on police stops. Uh, it has a very informative uh, homepage. Um, and uh, the main goal of this, of this cost action on police stops uh, is to generate, uh, uh, generate new knowledge on police stops uh, in EU member states uh, to set up an interactive map, for example, um, in order to help uh, 
EU member uh, citizens and uh, and other persons who, who visit European uh, uh, countries uh, to have some kind of uh, interactive knowledge on uh, uh, on several or separate uh, regulations on on polystoxin in EU member member states. And on the other hand, uh, we have several working groups uh, which uh, separately elaborate. Um, scientific journal publication, uh, publications, edited books, um, podcasts, and uh, other sources or, or outcomes of, uh, of scientific work. Um, uh, we have five working groups on understanding the practice of polystops uh, uh, from, uh, 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 from the point of view of police officers, understanding experiencing of polystops in Europe, uh, 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 from uh, the point of view of the persons who are under uh, a police stop and search or uh, identity check. Uh, uh, from my point of view, the most important working group is understanding the governance of police stops in Europe because I'm, I am a co-leader of this, of this working group. So my main uh, uh, research ex expertise on police stops covers the governance, the internal and mainly the, the external governance of, of, of police stops. The main question of, of governance is uh, what institutions uh, are responsible uh, for holding the police to account uh, regarding uh, performing carrying out uh, police stops in European Union countries. Um, and we have also a working group for on contextualizing uh, police stops in Europe, uh, try to, uh, uh, try to uh, use the synergies between uh, between uh, between uh, several areas of, of research, not only jurisprudence, but sociology, criminology, and other areas. And we try to apply um, a good comparative methodology in police stops research, uh, which, uh, uh, which is a task uh, of a separate working group, working group five. Uh, to tell the truth, um, um, I think uh, as an introduction, I, I must say uh, that um, uh, we have several researchers in that uh, in that cost action, and most of the researchers are not lawyers. So uh, um, the point of view or the approach of this uh, of this research uh, research uh, 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 program uh, mostly not a uh, not a legal way. Uh, most of the researchers are criminal criminologists, uh, sociologists, political scientists, and I think that uh, that the main area. For uh, for a lawyer um, uh, within this program is working group three uh, the understanding of the governance of the police stops because I think that from a legal point of view uh, this is the this is the most interesting uh, uh, area of this uh, of this research but of course it it is a subjective part uh, of that story so um, I try to I try to uh, make a short outlook on uh, 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 the European regulation on polystops. And I will focus uh, on the governance of polystops, so not uh, the practice, uh, not the experiencing or, or other, other areas, but I will focus due to my, uh, due to my interest and in area of expertise uh, to the governance uh, of, uh, of polystops. Uh, but first of all, uh, um, for some kind of starting points uh, or as an introduction, um, uh, as Professor Hoffman kindly informed me, uh, you have some kind of knowledge about uh, about uh, uh, about stop and search because uh, I know that uh, this is a very important issue uh, uh, in the United States of America, uh, and it has been uh, recent years uh, a, a hot issue not only in Europe but in America as well. Um, but I think that we should start some kind of uh, some kind of short uh, definition. Uh, it is some kind of process, uh, 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 sometimes together with some kind of identity check, which is carried out by the police to stop a person, uh, 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 prevent them uh, from pursuing their passage, and if necessary, proceed with the search. Uh, with the search uh, of, uh, of the body, with the search of, uh, of clothes, or even with the search uh, of the vehicle or, or car, um, um, in case uh, in case of some kind of suspicion. Uh, generally, we have two types of, of, uh, of stop and search, a reactive and a proactive one. Uh, the reactive one is when a person is suspicious uh, to police officers, 
are suspicious uh, about some some possible criminal offense or petty offense or or, or something like that, uh, and uh, um, and uh, the uh, police officers want to uh, gather some information or some evidence of of a possible uh, offense, and uh, uh, we can characterize a proactive one, uh, a proactive one when there are no suspicious uh, people. Uh, um, uh, in the area, but uh, police officers want to want to hold uh, the public order, hold up the public order, or keep up the public order, and uh, um, and sometimes they think that uh, uh, that conducting an identity check or a, or a stop uh, stop and search uh, could be a useful uh, and capable tool of uh, of. Um, uh, keeping a public order, sometimes uh, using using in, intimidating uh, tools and uh, and uh, procedures. Um, in Europe and I think in America as well, there are uh, several debates or controversies uh, about uh, about uh, uh, stop and search. Um, one of the main problems uh, uh, is when stop and search targets certain uh, population groups or, or, or minorities, for example, ethnic minorities. So police, uh, 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 police officers uh, sometimes do ethnic profiling uh, when they think that, that a person who, uh, um, who is a member of, uh, of an ethnic minority, uh, uh, black people, for example, or in Hungary, Roma people, um, are uh, um, are usually suspicious, suspicious for them, and even if they if they uh, if they show no uh, um, no trace or no uh, or no anything about suspicious behavior, uh, uh, they the police officers tend to uh, carry out stop and search or identity check uh, against these people or youngsters. Uh, um, especially immigrant youngsters or, or youngsters who live uh, uh, who live in in poor neighborhoods. Um, the main problem is uh, due to the literature in in European jurisprudence and uh, and in social sciences that uh, 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 stop and search, which are carried out not uh, uh, not in a care uh, um, not in a cautious and not in an efficient way, can affect the legitimacy. Legitimacy, legitimacy of the police, uh, because because the people, uh, uh, people who uh, um, the electorate who, meant, who maintain law enforcement agencies uh, can lose uh, trust in police officers and in police in general if uh, if they see that uh, that uh, uh, um, that police officers uh, uh, carry out stop and searches. Um, uh, on the base of bias, and uh, and and they are not efficient, and uh, and they are uh, they are brutal, and um, and uh, they don't think that they uh, uh, they should justify their actions uh, to the actual people who are the subject of these actions. Uh, so some uh, some words about the governance of police stops, uh, which is I think the main focus uh, of my presentation. As I mentioned before, uh, the main question or the main aim of the governance of police stops uh, is to hold the police to account. Uh, the police as, as a governmental agency must be held uh, to account in order to maintain the public trust um, in the police and the electorate, which maintains uh, governmental agencies and give, uh, uh, and give uh, funds to uh, governmental agencies, uh, uh, has to see the justification I have to see the justification of the performance uh, of the of the police stops, and if uh, 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 police officers infringe the law, infringe human rights and civil liberties, there must be some remedy processes and other accountability processes uh, uh, which can uh, uh, which can remedy these infringements. Um, if we are talking about the governance of police stops, uh, we can uh, uh, we can uh, talk about internal and external ways of governance, internal within the police, uh, and external uh, uh, carried out by other governmental and non-governmental uh, organizations. Uh, taking internal governance uh, into account, uh, we can say that. Uh, in these ways, accountability of the police and stop and search 
uh, is ensured by the hierarchical structure within the police. So um, police officers carrying out uh, stop and search are governed, ordered by their chiefs, by their leaders, and uh, uh, and by and by uh, at last um, elected politicians. Uh, it can be a part of internal governance sometimes. Um, what are the main tools of internal governance? Uh, policy formation and uh, formation and implementation. Uh, uh, most police agencies issue um, guidelines and policies uh, about carrying out uh, stop and search efficiently. Uh, deployment choices uh, can be also effective tool uh, of uh, of internal governance or procedures uh, aimed at ensuring individual police officers act professionally and efficiently um, carry out or organize uh, education programs for police officer uh, police officers how to uh, how to carry out efficiently uh, police uh, stop and search and not to infringe uh, civil liberties or sometimes internal disciplinary systems uh, uh, which are for sanctioning um, uh, police officers who infringe the law and uh, and uh, carry out not so efficient uh, uh, stop and search uh, procedures. Um, my main interest uh, lays in external governance. Uh, as, a, as a public lawyer, I think uh, it is the it is the most crucial point uh, of uh, of uh, of uh, organizing uh, police stop and search. Um, what institutions uh, can carry out external oversight over the performance of police stops, and uh, how uh, um, and in which ways uh, can these ex external gov uh, governance procedures uh, be efficient? Uh, external governance in a constitutional democracy uh, can be carried out by the legislature, parliament, or congress, or 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 anyhow called. Uh, called a legislative body by the plenum where, when, for example, an individual uh, a congressperson or, or member of parliament asks questions uh, uh, from ministers, secretary of state or, or, or the prime minister, even if we have a prime minister uh, at all. Um, and of course, the of course, the committees, uh, especially in Anglo-Saxon countries, uh, uh, can uh, uh, play a very important and efficient role. Uh, in holding the police uh, to account. Um, in several European countries, uh, uh, there are independent police complaint bodies, uh, IPCBs, uh, which are independent. They are not subordinate uh, to the government, to the executive. Um, in most cases, they are subordinate to the parliament, to the legislature, um, uh, but they are independent in, uh, in carrying out uh, uh, complaint mechanisms and issuing uh, policy recommendations. Um, there are uh, also ombudspersons uh, in in uh, in some European countries. Uh, I think uh, some kind of ombudspersons uh, operate in in the United States as well, uh, as far as I know it correctly. Um, we have some of them in European countries as well. Of course, courts, um, the judiciary, uh, play very important part uh, in uh, um, in holding. Uh, the police to account, um, doing uh, uh, criminal procedures uh, when a police officer uh, commit a, a criminal offense, for example, or also administrative courts uh, uh, can review also individual or normative decisions uh, uh, regarding police stops. And last but not least, uh, NGOs, non-governmental org organizations uh, can play also very, very important part uh, um, in uh, maintaining the efficiency and the legality of uh, police stop and search searches. Um, um, for the rest of my time, I try to be short. Uh, I, um, I selected uh, three countries, the United Kingdom, um, uh, France and, uh, uh, and Hungary, uh, of course, uh, three examples. So it will be not, uh, it will not be some kind of comprehensive uh, outlook to European countries. Uh, I selected these uh, th three uh, countries uh, because I think that from some kind of point of view, uh, they can be interesting to you and, uh, uh, and uh, they uh, represent uh, uh, typical, uh, typical uh, European countries regarding 
um, governance, uh, especially external governance of uh, of police stops. In the United Kingdom, which is a which is a parliament uh, parliamentary country, uh, a parliamentary state, um, uh, the parliament and especially parliamentary committees play traditionally very very uh, crucial role uh, in holding the government to account and uh, especially holding the police uh, uh, to account. Um, in the recent uh, decades, several reports uh, uh, have been issued issued. Uh, regarding police stops. For example, in 1981, the Scarman uh, report after the demonstrations in Brixton, which is a suburb, uh, a part of uh, part of London. Um, it was a time when the, uh, the conservative government, the Margaret Thatcher government, uh, uh, issued uh, and carried out um, very sensitive uh, austerity measures uh, and laws uh, uh, in the United Kingdom. And it resulted in, in riots and demonstrations. And these reports concluded that a reasonable suspicion uh, um, uh, should, be, uh, should be used um, regarding uh, police stops and uh, searches against discriminatory, uh, discriminatory uh, practices. Um, in the 90s, uh, the most important uh, investigation was the so-called McPherson inquiry. Um, it was it was about the institutional racism within uh, within police. In 1993, uh, uh, a black teenager uh, uh, was murdered uh, in uh, in England, and uh, during the police investigation, uh, there uh, 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 there were proofs fund, uh, founded uh, that uh, um, that uh, 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 a lot of police officers who who carried out police stops and searches and the investigation. Uh, um, was burdened by uh, by racism against uh, against black people, and uh, and the uh, uh, most important conclusion was uh, of the inquiry was that a recording, some kind of receipt uh, about stop and search and an identity check, is a must because it uh, um, it can enhance uh, a, a possible uh, a possible a later possible uh, remedy uh, process. Uh, uh, which uh, uh, which can correct uh, the forces and the infringements of law uh, during a police stop and search, and uh, later the Flanagan review in 2008 uh, uh, was also about efficient and important recording of police stop and search. Um, in the United Kingdom, uh, there is an independent office for police conduct, which is uh, which is some kind of independent uh, independent agency for for complaint mechanisms. Um, it handles individual complaints and it issues policy recommendations uh, for the government. Uh, a lot of them uh, uh, have, be, uh, have been issued uh, recently. In 2010, uh, uh, 2020-11 uh, policy recommendations uh, was issued. Um, in France, uh, in the 2000 years, uh, several riots, demonstrations, uh, 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 have been taken place uh, against uh, against police officers because of uh, the brutality uh, of the police against youngsters and ethnic minorities. Uh, maybe we can we can remember the, the news um, uh, uh, several years ago from uh, from France. Um, in France, uh, there is no an independent complaint body, but there is an ombudsperson, Defenseur de droit. Uh, 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 which is a parliament, uh, parliamentary elected uh, ombudsperson, uh, who also uh, can uh, can um, uh, tackle individual complaints, but the main area of its performance is policy recommendations, issuing uh, policy uh, recommendations regarding receipt for identity checks and stop and searches. Um, the government and especially the police unions are, are very strong in France. And they are not so keen on the performance of the ombudsperson. They, they have been not so keen on the performance uh, recently. Um, and most of the recommendations uh, of this ombudsperson uh, uh, have been failed uh, by the National Assembly and the police unions. And uh, the experience is that uh, police officers and police unions and police agencies um, fear internal control mechanisms. Uh, issued by their chiefs uh, much more than external uh, oversight 
procedures. And last but not least, some uh, words about Hungary, um, um, uh, which is my country, and I think I, I, um, I have, a, uh, I have uh, most information about Hungary and not uh, about the other countries. Until 2020, uh, we have an independent police complaints board, uh, uh, which was established in uh, 2008, after very severe demonstrations in 2006. Um, uh, in these years, the, the government uh, announced uh, possible austerity measures uh, because of the economic problems of the, of the Hungarian budget. And these uh, announcements resulted in, in very severe and, and very hard dem demonstrations uh, against the then government. And, uh, uh, and in order uh, to, uh, to tackle this issue, the parliament decided to, to set up an independent police complaint board, um, which uh, offered an alternative to internal complaint mechanisms. So uh, um, next to internal complaint procedures within the police, um, uh, uh, people who were subject to uh, stop and search on our identity check, uh, they could decide uh, uh, to issue a request to this uh, to this complaints board um, in order to in order to facilitate uh, an investigation. These board uh, issued annual reports to Parliament, which is where, which uh, uh, which are very important uh, sources of information about police stops and search in Hungary. And due to these reports and decisions, the main problems. Uh, of Hungary and stop and search were very similar to uh, uh, to other countries' uh, problems. Ethnic profiling um, in Hungary uh, not uh, uh, not usually not always uh, not not against uh, black people but Roma or Gypsy people. The very uh, there is a very important or or very serious problem of the so-called general identity check when a police officer carries out a stop and search or identity check. Um, not because of some suspicion. Um, the police officer cannot justify or cannot reason uh, uh, their action uh, with some kind of suspicion. Um, if somebody asks the police officer, why am I a subject of an identity check? The police officer says, it's, we have no, we have no actual, actual reason for that. It, it is a general, general identity check, uh, which, is, which is against the law, uh, uh, to tell the truth. And proportionality uh, is also a very uh, serious problem. Um, sometimes Hungarian police officers tend to uh, use handcuffs uh, um, in cases where it is not so necessary, uh, if I can use this understatement. Um, these complaints board uh, uh, was seized in uh, 2020, uh, 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 so in 2020, and the ombudsman, ombudsperson, uh, took over um, the tasks of uh, of uh, the oversight of uh, of the uh, police performance um, the, instead of uh, instead of the complaints board. Of course, uh, judicial review is a tool uh, for the for the external oversight. After um, fulfilling or using the internal complaint uh, complaint mechanisms within the police. Um, um, the person who were subject uh, to police stop and search can issue a request uh, uh, to uh, to the administrative court, and it can review the police performance from a legal point of view. Uh, there are several NGOs uh, like Hungarian Civil Liberties Union or the Hungarian Helsinki Committee, uh, which play uh, a very crucial part uh, in holding the police to account uh, uh, with policy papers, research programs. Or, or um, they uh, uh, they usually do uh, legal representation um, in in uh, uh, court procedures. Uh, they do a very hard and uh, and very uh, respectful job uh, in Hungary uh, regarding police stops. I think that uh, this is the end. Uh, thank you, thank you for your attention. I hope I wasn't uh, very long. Um, I feared that I was. Uh, 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 sorry for that. And I'm very happy to answer any questions from you in this topic. Thank you. Great, thank you, Professor. Um, if you would like to unshare your screen, then we can see you again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm trying. Okay, no problem. Take your time. 
well, well. I actually, I might be able to do it from here. Let me try. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there we I go. There we go. You're back. We can see you now. Right. Great. Right. Uh, so, no, I think that was wonderful because, uh, to be honest, uh, if, even for me, you know, I spend I spend a fair amount of time these days uh, before COVID, of course, um, in, in Europe working with professors. Um, sometimes in France, where I was teaching for many years on a temporary basis, and more recently in Poland, where I do a lot of work with the chair of criminal law at Jagiellonian University in Krakow. Yeah. But despite that uh, involvement in, uh, you know, with European scholars, um, almost everything you told me today was new to me, and so I really appreciate hearing that kind of analysis of how this works uh, in Europe. I have a couple of quick comments, but then I want to turn to my students who may have uh, questions that they would like uh, to ask. Um, just a couple of quick comments. Um, I was really a little surprised, but also really impressed with your um, the way that you started almost at the very beginning of your talk, you just drew the distinction between reactive and proactive police behavior. Yeah. This distinction, I personally think, is crucial, absolutely crucial to understanding issues involving regulation of police. And yet, in America, we do not draw a legal distinction between the police powers proactive and the police powers reactive. It is hiding in the background of our law in the United States. What I mean by that is we have one entire body of law under the Fourth Amendment that um, says that police generally need to have probable cause before they can take any action against someone generally. And also they frequently need to get a warrant from a judge. That's one body of law. We have an entirely separate body of law that comes from the Terry decision that says that the police in different situations can uh, act against someone in a more restrained way, can stop them temp for a brief period, can pat them down for weapons based on reasonable suspicion. And these two bodies of law are not, there, there is not a clear distinction about when one body applies and when the other body of law applies. And it seems to me that your distinction between reactive and proactive situations is the thing we are missing in our law. It's the distinction between when we should impose the stricter rule and, and let the police do more things, but with more of a requirement of evidence and proof, that's the, that's the reactive side. And on the other side is the Terry stops, the, the sort of rather restrained kind of interaction between the police and the citizen that is really about proactive police behavior. But we don't draw that distinction in that way. And so it was really great that you highlighted that at the very beginning. Of course, we have exactly the same problems that you describe in terms of targeting, in terms of profiling, in terms of legitimacy. We fight those problems all the same way. In terms of how to govern the police, I have kind of a question, I suppose, which is, do you think that internal governance, we've always been very skeptical here of that. And partly that's because we don't trust any government officials at all in the United States. But also it's partly because I think most people would say that the big barrier to internal governance being effective is police culture. That the police in America anyway, have a culture of silence, of protecting each other, of you know, the band of brothers with their code of silence. And that's why we think it has to be external to the police to be effective. I wonder about your thoughts about that. I wanna say one thing about ombudspersons. So you mentioned that there's some 
type of thing like that in the US, but in reality, not really. I mean, we really do not have the institution that you have in Europe. My students, if they are three L's, may remember that uh, before COVID, one of the last big public events we held at the law school in person was a speech by a person who was then the ombudsman in Poland. This was Adam Bodnar. Yes, Professor Bodnar, yes. Yeah, Professor Bodnar, who's a wonderful fellow. Yeah. And he came here to Bloomington and he gave a wonderful speech in the room right over there. And, um, you know, that was a kind of introduction for many of our students to the concept of an ombudsman. What does an ombudsman do, an ombudsperson? We really don't have a tradition of that. You can find rare examples in some states. There are such offices, but it's not part of our legal culture here to have this government official who is really supposed to be, in a way, the critic of the government. That's, that's the role of the ombudsperson, is to yeah. hear citizen complaints and to respond often by being <clears throat> very critical of the government. We have, we have people who, from time to time, perform that, that role, like perhaps a special prosecutor or someone, someone else who's appointed to, to conduct some kind of investigation. But we really don't have the institution that you have in Europe that is such, such a key part of European governance. And then, uh, you know, that leads me to the final point, which I'm sure you are well aware, but, you know, in the US, really, the, by far the leading role in regulating our police is the courts. And that's been true for more than 50 years now, ever since the Supreme Court made this a constitutional matter by the way that they expanded the coverage of the Fourth Amendment. Um, that's mostly who regulates our police, either in a criminal context through the exclusionary rule or in a civil context through lawsuits filed against the police for various kinds of behavior. We do have citizen review boards. And I think that is a way in which we have a kind of similar structure to some of what you described in Europe that, that we have these citizen boards in many towns. Bloomington has one. Many cities have them to uh, hear complaints. And maybe that's maybe that's our version of ombudsperson that we give it to a kind of citizen review board. But those are all my comments, Professor. Um, do you want to say something about police culture since I asked the question, and then I will open it up to my students? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that your comments and and questions are very interesting, and. I think that the first two of them, um, the problem of internal uh, governance and uh, and uh, uh, almost persons, I think that uh, they have some kind of common base, uh, which is the problem of trust. Um, I think that that this is the key element of of this question: the uh, the trust, the trust, uh, uh, the trust of people in in their institutions, um, including the police itself but the external institutions as well. Um, um, and I think that, that, uh, uh, that the example of, of uh, Professor Bodnar from, from Poland is a very good e example for that. So um, most uh, police agencies, not, not only in, in America, but in, but in Europe, uh, are some kind of band of brothers. So they are trusting each other and they don't want uh, external persons and institutions to interfere uh, with their with their business uh, so uh, they are very suspicious uh, to external to external persons and and uh, institutions um, these external agencies uh, and and organizations uh, can be effective only if they um, if they hold the public trust uh, in their hands and I think that um, that the main problem uh, um, problem with Professor Bodnar in Poland was that uh, uh, that uh, uh, that he has he, uh, he has had a, a great deal of public trust um, in in himself, and that uh, that was the main problem with with him from the side of the Polish government. Uh, I think that uh, I think that the Polish government uh, are, are, is um, looking at him. Uh, as some kind of source of problems, a source of political problems, because he takes uh, his job seriously and tries uh, and tries to 
to probe, to scrutinize the, the Polish uh, uh, government uh, regarding administration of courts, uh, the performance of the police, and so on and so on. And, uh, and it, is a, it is a great political offense um, 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 uh, on the side of on the side of the of the Polish government, and yeah, to, to, to be to be sure, Professor, when he came and visited us, we were a little worried that he might not get back into Poland after that visit. <laughs> yeah, and and um, I'm not very aware of the of the recent recent developments of 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 the Polish uh, uh, political uh, political issues, but I think that by now he's under he's under some kind of investigation. Uh, by the government, so I think that we have we have serious problems. Uh, they have serious pro serious problems in Poland. Um, on the other hand, in Hungary, we have an ombudsperson as well, um, uh, who is a who is a, who is a lawyer who formerly worked uh, uh, for the government party, uh, where it uh, where it was in opposition. Uh, 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 ombuds uh, ombudsperson Kozma. Uh, I think he worked for uh, for the Fidesz party, for the government party, and he take up not very much conflicts with the government. To tell the truth, so I think that he uh, he chose another way uh, uh, than than uh, Professor Bodnar did, um, and I think that that uh, uh, he 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 has gained the, the government's trust. Uh, but I'm not sure that uh, that he he has gained the trust of the people. So I think that the crucial point is uh, that uh, these external uh, oversight bodies, including parliament, committees, uh, inter, uh, external bodies and courts, can operate efficiently if uh, they are active and they are aiming uh, to gain the trust uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the people. And, um, um, I think that uh, that, uh, for example, in Hungary and in Poland and in the Central and Eastern European countries, it is it is a very serious uh, problem. The people's trust in their institutions. Okay. It, it is main problem. That's very helpful. In the I'm going. In the yes. Yes. 